I'm very happy to welcome Martin Schack now. Martin Schack is an economist by training, but he's a lot more than that. He's a historian, a political analyst, a best-selling author, and a very, very good speaker. His TED address had more than 4 million views. I'm excited to see how many views we get today. Martin told me a while ago that he's busy, busy writing a new book now, and on average it takes him six years to write a book. I think he has two more years to go. In the meantime, um, until his new book is ready, I can recommend this one. It's a very, very uh, good book. It's a book where you have a lot of aha experience. You suddenly understand how things are the way they are. And it is also very well written, pretty easy to read. So if you're interested in China, and the, not only in China, but also the world, it is one of these books which I would very much recommend. One of Martin's theses is, is that we in the Western world often think that when societies, when economies develop, they would converge into the, our Western model. That is, however, not always true, and it's particularly not true when we talk about China. Martin, we are all pretty excited to hear your arguments why this is not true. The floor is yours, Martin. Well, thank you very much, Jan. Uh, I'd like to start with what I'll call the big picture of China. Of course, we all know it's got a huge population, nearly one fifth of the world's population, 1.4 billion people, still the largest country, slightly larger than India. Secondly, it an, has, has an enormous uh, physical area. It's actually the fourth largest physically uh, in the world. Thirdly, it's the longest continuously existing polity or, if you like, political unit in the world. It is over 2,000 years old. Uh, no other country in the world can compare with this extraordinarily long period. But of course, in another sense, China is much, much older than this. Uh, Chinese civilization uh, dates back at least four or five thousand years. Now, there's something else which is extraordinarily important about China, and that is it has on at least four, arguably five periods of history been the most advanced country or maybe one of the most advanced countries, because we're going back a long time. It starts uh, with the Han Dynasty, which is over 2,000 years ago. Then, a few hundred years later, the Tang Dynasty. And then the Sung Dynasty. And then the Ming Dynasty. And then, fifthly, part of the Qing dynasty. Now, please bear in mind that there is no other country like this in the world. Usually, actually, what happens is that countries rise and fall. Of course, now you think of, the, of ancient Greece, you think of the Roman Empire, um, you might think of the British Empire, but each of these rose and fall never to rise again. China is different. China has had arguably four or five periods where it has been the most important country in the world, or the most important area in the world before the, area, the era of countries as nation states and so on. And again, remember, that we are on the eve now of a fifth period or sixth period in Chinese history where it will be the most important country in the world. Because it seems to me that there's absolutely no question that China will soon replace the United States as the most important 
an influential country in the world. So this is a remarkable civilization, which seems to me has no obvious parallel uh, or peer uh, in human uh, history. But there's a problem. Or at least the West has a problem, a very serious one. We don't understand China. We don't get it. And the reason we don't get it is that we try and understand China in our own terms, in Western terms. But you can't understand China in Western terms. Of course, China has affinities and commonalities with us, but fundamentally, China is very different from the West. It always has been, it still is, and it always will be. The problem is, I suppose, the Western mentality. You see, for 200 years, starting with Europe and then later the United States and so on, the West has dominated and effectively controlled the world. So that we think of modernity as Western modernity. Eternity. There is only one form of modernity, that is Western modernity. But this is simply not true. We have Chinese modernity evolving rapidly now. We've had Japanese modernity, for example, and we'll see and are seeing many others. It is simply not true that there is only one form of modernity, a Western modernity. There will and are already many modernities in the world. So in this context, the idea that everyone must be like us, everyone should be like us, is wrong. In other words, we have to understand China in its own terms. We cannot understand China in Western terms. And this is the great challenge. And this, by the way, our mentality is why we don't understand China. This is why we get China wrong. I mean, I remember vividly in the late 20th century, as China began to grow, and I'll come back to this, of course, as China began to grow very quickly under with the impact of Deng Xiaoping's reforms from 1978, you know, this was largely, they are exaggerating the figures, the statistics aren't true, it will never be possible to sustain this. We were wrong. We were hugely wrong. We didn't understand China. Another proposition was that unless China has a political system like ours, a Western style democracy, China's extraordinary transformation will not continue. It will be unsustainable. Well, here we are now in 2020, uh, over 30 years after the great reform started in China, and the Chinese political system remains as different now as it was before. Uh, bear in mind here, by the way, of Francis Fukuyama, the American writer, uh, the American theorist and writer, he argues that one that, that China uh, has a more than any other country in the world has has enjoyed a powerful continuity in its governing system for well over 2,000 years. In other words, in the emperor period and now in the communist period, what is striking is not the differences, but the lines of continuity. So please don't expect to China politically to be like the West, because it's not going to be like uh, the West. We have to respect China for what it is. We have to understand it in its own terms. We have to be curious, not dismissive. 
we have to have an open, not a closed mind if we want to make sense of this extraordinary civilization. Now, very reasonably, you might say, well, okay, why is it so different? Why is China so distinct uh, from our tradition uh, in the West? Well, I would make, there are many points that could be made here, but I will just make three points. The first is that China is not even primarily a nation state. You know, we think in the Western tradition very much of nation states. And China, in the late 19th century, when it was very weak, when it was in the process of being partially colonized by the, West, by the Europeans and so on, uh, China did begin to take on some of the characteristics of a nation state. But I don't think it even now is primarily a nation state. I don't think you can really understand China in these terms. And think of China. 2,000 years of a continuously existing polity. Four or 5,000 years of Chinese civilization. So what, where do the primary characteristics come from in China, for China? I don't think from its uh, uh, relatively limited encounter with nation statehood. I don't think it comes from that period because we're only talking, what, 120, 130 years? China's at least 2,000 years old. No, we're talking about, and this is very different from the West, we're talking about an inheritance which above all is a function, is a product, of Chinese civilization, not China as a nation state. So really, the key characteristics of China are a function of China's civilizational history. Let me give you some examples. Well, probably one of the most important is undoubtedly uh, Confu Confucian values. I mean, Confucius, great philosophy, a philosopher living two and a half thousand years ago with a, 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 a number of other key figures uh, in that era. And Confucius um, talked about the fundamental importance of the fam family, that the emperor should model, model himself on the father, uh, that the importance of uh, meritocracy, the importance of good governance, the importance of a strong state, the importance of the relationship between government and the individual. These were very distinctive ideas. And even today, they remain very di distinctive ideas. And they influence not only China, by the way, but they also influence what we might call the Confucian states. The Confucian states, Japan in some degree, uh, South Korea, uh, Vietnam, uh, Taiwan, and so on. These are all uh, very heavily influenced by Confucian. Uh, thinking. Or the relationship between state and society. The relationship between state and society, very different in China. Or the notion of the family, the nature of the family. Again, very distinctive in China. So there are a set of uh, uh, guanxi, uh, very important. Guanxi is, uh, uh, best, best be translated, I suppose, as, as relationships. And the way in which relationships work. Uh, and so on. It's uh, like a tissue of connectivity uh, in China. Very important to understanding the nature of Chinese society uh, and uh, and Chinese culture. Or for that matter, we could add, you know, the nature of uh, of, of uh, the Chinese language, language, which is a common written script, but there are actually many languages spoken in China. Which sometimes they're called dialects, but it doesn't matter. It's the same thing in effect uh, here. Or Chinese food. You know many great cuisines across China. Uh, so uh, this is all a product of China as a civilization, not China as a nation state. Now this is very, very different from uh, Europe and the United States and so on. I mean, uh, the uh, countries like the United States, Australia, which were a product of uh, 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 colonization in the first instance before they. Uh, gained independence are really only a product of, of, of being a nation state, in effect. Uh, European societies go back further, but by and large, European nation states 
the past is very distant and uh, uh, and so they are fundamentally shaped by the experience of being a nation state so you can see here how different uh, uh, China is uh, from the Western tradition and I if I would say this is the most fundamental point that China is a product of civilization rather than uh, uh, being a nation state my second point is about the state and society and again of course this is closely uh, linked to the civilizational history of China uh, but um, the the nature of the relationship between the state and society is very very different from the Western tradition now, people now in in rather ill-informed and ignorant political debates you know they think it's all about Mao or communism or something like that forget it that is not the primary a historical link. The primary historical link is this long tradition that runs back to be well before Confucius, but which Confucius heavily influenced, which was a very, very uh, close, intimate relationship between the state and society. At the heart of Confucius' thinking was the state and the importance of the relationship between the state and the individual. And as I mentioned, that the emperor should model himself on the father. In other words, a familial conception of the state. This is very important, a familial conception of the state uh, in Chinese thinking uh, and practice. And you'll see this in all sorts of ways if you look uh, uh, closely. Uh, and of course, uh, meritocracy. I mean, you know, this was the Confucius emphasis on the importance of meritocracy. There's no question at all, in my view, that especially given it's a developing country, that China has the most competent and sophisticated form of governance in the world. That's why, that's the key to understanding, I think, uh, 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 some of uh, China's uh, achievements uh, in uh, recent years. And by the way, I mean, may, you know, we think in the West, understandably, uh, that, you know, le legitimacy, is a function of elections um and as Ch i suppose the thinking would be then well as china doesn't have uh universal suffrage then uh the regime the state does not enjoy legitimacy this is quite wrong actually quite wrong if you look at the pew surveys and so on uh china's uh, uh government enjoys more legitimacy more support uh, than any Western country. I mean, this is extraordinary. But we have to understand. We have to think with different logics when it comes to China, uh, uh, and and this is very important uh, 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 to our understanding of the country. Now, the third point I want to make about uh, this, um, you know, how China is different to the West. Uh, I'm using the West as my comparator here. Uh, is that um, China? has never been an expansionist power uh this is i, I mean i mean it, it 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 certainly had a universalist view of itself in other words that china was the highest form of civilization just like europe had a universalist view of itself but europe's interpretation of its universalism was that it should civilize the world which of course is exactly what happened with uh colonial empires and so on um and that tradition in some way or other continues to this day you know european uh, western western values are superior should be adopted institutions government systems and so on the chinese have never had that tradition uh the chinese attitude is yes we are the insofar as they thought in these terms yes we are the most uh, advanced form of civilization and so on um but we are the middle kingdom and you know we don't really want we don't want to expand abroad because we, uh, to other countries and so on uh, because uh, uh, we you know that would be a step down uh, uh, in comparison with Chinese history and Chinese civilization and so really there's no tradition in China of expansionism I mean they they certainly had a global system or rather of course in those days only a regional system because there was not such thing if you go back far enough as a global system but uh china was not you know was not didn't militarily occupy these countries uh, it didn't expand in that way i'll tell you how it expanded 
it expanded partly economically and partly and very importantly culturally. In fact, if you want to know the two things that really matter to the Chinese, one is economic and the other is culture. And this is very, very different from the Western tradition, you know, the European tradition and the American tradition, uh, where uh, military expansion and political influence have been uh, extremely important. Now, I hope that this gives you uh, some idea of how, what, how challenging for us, certainly in the West, understanding China is because it's so different. Now we can either just dismiss it because we're you know we're the top dogs who've been the top dogs and always going to be the top dogs. We are certainly not. And we are living in the era where that is coming to an end. Or we can think this is really interesting. I this challenges many of the ways I've thought in the past. Uh and uh, I need to understand it. And I think this is um the mindset uh that in this era and in the future uh, we need to have in our attitude towards and our relationship uh with china now for a long time of course we didn't really need to understand china did we because uh from uh when from the early 19th century china went into decline and um that process continued for the rest of the 19th century and into the 20th century and i suppose that era finally began to come to an end in the middle of the 20th century basically for various reasons china missed out on the industrial revolution and then it was a victim of uh western superiority and not least partial colonization by european powers japan and also in a very small way the united states so for that period uh of western as it were expansion and triumph uh china uh was in a hell of a mess um and uh sank into great poverty so China became invisible and people didn't think about it. But this began to change. I think the revolution in 1949 was very important, even though Mao made some very serious mistakes. He sort of got the country together again in a way that it had just not been together. Uh, it was ineffectively reunified. He got rid of the foreign uh, uh foreign invaders of china it brought the colonization of parts of china to an end and so on and there was a modest economic growth but the real economic turning point and why we're all taking notice of china now because it's irresistible starts in 1978 and the economic reforms introduced by Deng xiaoping you know in 1978 the Chinese economy was one twentieth of the size of the American economy. Five percent. About 80 percent of the population lived in abject poverty. And then there was what I suppose you could reasonably be described, although it's an overworked term, there was a miracle. China for the next 35 years grew on average at 10% a year. As a result, 800 million people have been taken out of poverty. That accounts for two thirds of the reduction in global poverty over the period from 1978 till the present. I mean, what an extraordinary achievement that has been. By 2040, the China, according to the World Bank International Comparison Program, China overtook the United States as the largest economy in the world, as measured by GDP primary purchasing power. It has not yet overtaken uh, United States uh, in uh, measured by foreign currency, measured by the dollar. 
but that is that is very very close now uh, historically uh, speaking I would say that I can't think of another candidate that can shine a light to China that this period of economic transformation is the most remarkable one there has historically uh, ever been and of course this process is continuing i mean it's not growing as quickly as it did before uh it's growing around about six or a bit over six percent a year except this year we'll come back to that but uh, with the covid and so on um and the projection well the pro there, there are projections about the future remember their projections uh you know because no one knows the future uh but uh, the projections about china have been uh, quite quite accurate actually generally broadly speaking the projection is that by 2030 now this is measuring different countries gdp by ppp primary purchasing power that the chinese economy uh, will account for one third of the global economy it will be twice as large as the american economy and it will be larger than the american and the european union economies put together so <laughs> with a future like that we need to understand uh china um we might have been able to ignore it um when it was invisible but its transformation means that we have to take note of china and understand it and have a good relationship with it a, a constructive relationship with it by what i would call forced mayor china has arrived big time on the global stage do you think the west can come to terms with this i mean i think the developing world is in the process and it certainly will come to terms with it can the west come to terms with it can the west learn from elsewhere and not think that it has the answers that it's a sort of universal yardstick i think this is a going to be this is a big question and the answer i think is unclear you know there was a period uh, i think in early this century when uh, there was a cur real curiosity about china uh, its growth rates were phenomenal um, the reduction in poverty was greatly admired it was seen as an opportunity but then then i think the mood in the west changed it was something of course to do with trump but it's only not only trump uh i think that in america you know china became seen as a threat a threat a threat to america's status as the number one power in the world well look let's be realistic about this china's not uh, the united states is not going to be number one in the world forever it's not going to be number in the world for very long now but so what i mean countries rise and fall that's been universal in history i mean just as china has risen four or five times it's also gone down uh four or five times and china you know if it's the top dog which it certainly will be it's going to stay there forever you know history is history is full of this kind of thing so but for the for this period for the next century or so i would say certainly uh, china is going to be extraordinarily important uh, in the world and much more important by the way i think but in a different way than the united states probably uh, ever uh, has been now can we come to terms with this and i think that one of the problems with this kind of there's been a a kind of uh frosting over of the atmosphere a, a, a negativity crept in in relationship uh to china you know china's a threat you can't trust it and so on actually when i look and listen to people talking like this i realize they don't know the first thing about china by and large you know they talk about mao the return to 1949 they talk about the chinese communist party oh we know all about that remember the soviet communist party remember the cold war and so on 
listen, these people don't know the first thing about China. It is true that the Chinese Communist Party has the same two words as the Soviet Communist Party, Communist Party. But I can tell you now that those two organizations have historically very, very little in common. The Chinese Communist Party is Chinese, Chinese, Chinese. You cannot understand this phenomenon without understanding Chinese history. It is a product of and it's rooted in Chinese history. And any understanding of China can't start off with the Cold War, can't start off with 1949, but must understand what I've been talking about, which is the nature of Chinese history, the difference that is Chinese history and culture, and the importance of Chinese civilization. So uh, we shouldn't deal with cardboard cutouts. We shouldn't deal with cliches. We shouldn't deal in a very limited Western mentality that everyone should be like us because it's not true. It never, it, there has been a historical period when the West has been extraordinarily important, but it, before that it wasn't. And it is, it is less and less important now. So we have to open our eyes. We have to listen. We mustn't deal in cliches and cardboard cutouts. We mustn't celebrate our own provincialism and ignorance about difference. On the contrary, we must be open-minded and we must embrace and learn about uh, a culture as important, a civilization as important as China. I think what I want to do uh, in conclusion is something rather different to what I've been doing which is I just want to talk about one issue because I think it tells us quite a lot in good ways and bad ways. And that is COVID-19. Now, we know, or we think we know, we don't really know, but uh, our first assumption, still the first assumption, is that COVID started off in China or became important in China. That's and it might have come from anywhere, we don't know. Uh, and uh, during the course of January, the Chinese were struggling to understand it and so on. And China was subject to a barrage of abusive publicity in this period, which ran into February, March. Even now you can hear it. Um, that the Chinese efforts to deal with it were characterized by secrecy and cover up and false statistics and so on. And when I look back now on the period of this year, I think this was disgraceful. I mean, there was China on its own trying to deal with something that was entirely new which it was utterly unfamiliar with, from which people were dying in large numbers. And we can now see that China's efforts to contain COVID-19 were extraordinarily successful. Do you know? There are only less than 4,550 people in China died from COVID-19. Basically, the Chinese were successful in containing the virus to Wuhan and Hubei province, which is where Wuhan is situated. It didn't spread in any serious way across China. Beijing has had about seven deaths. Shanghai has had, I think it's five or six deaths. In other words, very, very little. There have been no recent cases of COVID-19 in China. The country 
is returning now to relative normality. The economy is growing again. China will be the only country this year to show any economic growth. Every other country in the world will be subject to varying degrees of contraction. Now compare this with what's happening in the West. What a mess. Look at America. Look at my own country, the UK. Look at Europe, varying degrees. The Nordic countries have done quite well. Germany's done it sort of okay. But nothing as good as China. And by the way, we're not just talking about China here. We're also talking about the other Confucian countries. Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong. They have all also done very well. They are in the same, if you like, league as China in relationship to COVID-19. So we have to draw, I think, or we have the, we have to draw uh, some conclusion, or rather, we have to ask a question: Why? Why has China and these countries as well done so well? Because remember, they're not all communist regimes; they vary in terms of their governments. Why have they all done so well, and why has the West done so bad? This is a very important question because I, I would guess that this is far from the last pandemic we're going to suffer in coming decades. And I think the reason is twofold, to put it simply. The first is that Chinese governance is extremely effective. Now, I don't mean effective because it's authoritarian. That's a Western term. But I wouldn't use that term myself, not for none of these countries. It is to do with the Confucian roots of China and these countries. And those roots mean two things. First, extremely effective governance. And I said earlier, and I will repeat now, the Chinese government is an extremely effective institution. I mean, you know, this extraordinary economic transformation is not just because of markets, markets, markets. No! At the heart of China's transformation and the strategy has been the Chinese government. And that is how it has handled COVID-19. I mean, you know, excuse my language, but I look at my own country and it's been such a bloody mess on COVID-19. It doesn't know what it's doing. It doesn't know where it's going. The Chinese and the Japanese and these other countries, from the word go, their attitude was, first and foremost, we must get rid of COVID-19. We're not going to live with it. We're going to eliminate it. And by and large, that's exactly what they've done. The Western societies can't make up their mind what they're doing. Actually, they have made up their mind by and large. They're going to live with it. And, you know, the consequences economically and so on are going to be very bad. You can see this already because we're going to a second wave. And what's going to happen? Is it going to go on like this? You know, it's on. Now, the second point, which is as, as important as my first point, the first point being about the quality of central governance, the second point is the attitude of the people. The way the people think, the way the people interpret society. You see, we pride ourselves in the West on a sort of notion of individualism. And everywhere, including my own country, you know, the rules and regulation being introduced to deal with COVID-19 are being challenged. You know, we need our liberties, we want our liberties and so on. Now, that by and large has not been the pattern at all in these countries. They understand, people understand. The importance of society. It's not just you. It's not just me. It's the impact of me on you. My behavior affects you. My behavior may imperil your future, your life. And so there's a much greater awareness of the importance of society, of social solidarity, of observing rules, and so on. And my, my son at the moment is living in Seoul. Uh, uh, he's a student on, and uh, just finished at Stanford University. And uh, he, he makes the point to me that every single person in Seoul outdoors wears a mask. Everyone. 
So um, I think this probably brings uh, my uh, remarks uh, to a conclusion. Uh, you know, China is a most extraordinary country. Rather than thinking of it as a threat, we should learn about it, be inquisitive, and enjoy it. Because it's not only going to become very important, extremely important, already becoming extremely important everywhere, but it's also fascinating. And it's a rich treasure trove for us to draw on to understand human history and the future of humanity. Thank you very much. Martin, it's very easy to understand how your TED talk got so many views. Very great entertainment and very interesting views. Um, a lot to think about. Um, also for us here at BUS, we probably need to prepare our next China summit very soon. Thank you so much, Martin. It was great. Thank you.